Hey there, um, just quick introduction before we get into the program. Uh, so this was our first History Speaks lecture that we did um, back in person since the pandemic. Um, we were gonna do it as a, as a hybrid, so in person as well as uh, live streamed, but unfortunately the technology didn't cooperate as much as we hoped. Um, hopefully we've sorted out some of those bugs for next time, but um, thankfully, even though the live stream died, uh, we did have the local recording happening. So um, I was able to cobble together this. There's just a little gap in the middle where the recording um, program kind of failed, uh, but it's just a, it's a brief thing. Almost all of it's here. It's a great presentation. Um, so if it, if it feels a little wonky, that's why um, the, the case is. Uh, and again, we'll hopefully we'll sort that out for next time. But in the meantime, um, really, uh, it's a great program um, that Paul did. And uh, I'm just going to throw to the recording. Um, this is Paul Clark um, talking about the um, story of William Jennings Bryan and his intersection, um, even if it's just for a brief time here in central Wisconsin. Um, so enjoy the program. Thanks so much, Ben. <clears throat> okay, so uh, William Jennings Bryan, uh, this whole idea about William Jennings Bryan actually came up in a uh, conversation that Ben and I had via email. As I was looking up some information on the suffrage movement in Wausau, uh, particularly I was, I was looking up when did uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony come to town, I found a passage somewhere on the internet uh, that William Jennings Bryan had been here as well. Uh, and that kind of set off a, a chain of looking into William Jennings Bryan and kind of the idea for this that came from Ben doing some digging on uh, some articles about his uh, visits here. Uh, and if there's one thing that stands out to me about William Jennings Bryan is that he is such a principled politician. Uh, he is always fighting for the cause of right, even when that isn't necessarily the most popular course. Uh, so I wanted to call this a man of principles, William Jennings Bryan in Wausau. In many ways, when you look at William Jennings Bryan and his political career, which spans three decades, uh, he is someone who is popping up again and again with the most critical issues of his time. And some of the issues aren't that foreign to us today. Uh, one of the political issues that William Jennings Bryan deals with is inflation, which might be a concern of some today. Uh, another is, uh, what should America's role be in world affairs, and what is the correct role of America in the world? Uh, and a third is, what's taught in schools, and what should it be okay for schools to teach about? Uh, so in order to understand William Jennings Bryan and, and getting that people at home and here maybe have different levels of background on William Jennings Bryan. Most of us, if we know about William Jennings Bryan, most likely know the Scopes trial, I'm thinking, and maybe perhaps the Cross of Gold speech. Uh, so we'll try and give a little bit of context. Uh, actually starting, uh, the, the Scopes trial comes very late in his life and career. Uh, so we'll actually back things up to what's leading up to one of his most famous speeches but I want to put it in the context of Marathon County and Wausau. All right, so a little bit of background on where Marathon County and Wausau are at in the late 1800s and, and early 1900s. Uh, and this is a time of just massive change, uh, not just in Marathon County and Wausau, but kind of everywhere. Uh, and those changes are kind of the classic changes we see with the second industrial revolution, that shift to a manufacturing factory machine economy. Uh, and so if we think about Wausau, uh, you know, at this time, what are some of the forces? They're the same forces, they're the same drivers that we're going to see throughout the United States. Uh, so that will be the railroad, that will be steam power, electricity, uh, immigration, and also the introduction of machinery on farms. Uh, and what that's going to mean in, in Wausau is as, as factories get built in this city, uh, more and more people come to this city, right? So population growth is going to be uh, key during this time. Uh, between 1870 and 1880, the population of central Wisconsin uh, doubles to 55,000 people. And that's, that's not just Marathon County, that's the surrounding uh, four counties, Marathon, Portage, Clark, and Wood. Um, Wausau itself, 
uh, with the rise of manufacturing, with the rise of mill uh, work, goes from 1,300 people in 1870 to 4,200 people in 1880. So it triples in that decade. And then between 1880 and 1885, in five years, Wass's population goes from 4,200 to 8,800. So it triples in 10 years and then doubles again in five. Okay, so what, what's really driving this? A, a, a lot of stuff, but m mostly uh, is the rise of manufacturing. More and more people are likely to work in a factory now than previously. Some of these workers are going to be coming from the farm, and farms are increasingly being run with new machinery that does the work of many laborers. Um, but a lot of these workers will be immigrants as well. So uh, here's a picture of workers at, at Curtis and Yale, uh, sash works and, and, and windows, uh, and, uh, that, which started in 1881. Uh, and here's Murray Machinery, uh, built in 1895. And so for a lot of these, whether they're immigrants or former agricultural workers, this is going to be a massive change in your life. Uh, not only are you bound to the clock, uh, but you're also subject to uh, harsh working conditions and the dangers of mill work. Uh, right throughout uh, Wisconsin in 1906, just to give you kind of a, an idea of, of how many uh, fatalities we're talking about because of, of uh, uh, mill work, uh, there are 7,200 industrial accidents in, in Wisconsin in 1906, and close to 200 of them are fatal. Uh, so uh, sawmill accidents will be uh, very common in this area, uh, and we're also going to see uh, the entrance of women into manufacturing. Uh, so that's, these, are, these are significant changes, things that people haven't been experiencing uh, before. And along with that, we have the modernization of the city, what we think of as kind of the modern city, right? Uh, what does that mean? Well, we've got electricity, we've got running water, we have mass media in the cities. And so uh, here's, a, here's a view of Third Street in, in Wausau, uh, which uh, Wausau would, would have gotten... Uh, its first electric light in 1883. Uh, and uh, the first shop that had electric lights in it was 1885. Uh, by the time you get to 1906, we've got streetcars as well. Uh, so all of these changes mean that if you would look at, say, Wausau in 1880 and compare it to Wausau in 1900, you'd be looking at, a, at an absolutely different place, OK? That, that time period uh, witnessed a lot of change here. Uh, and, and with these changes, people's lives in some ways are much more globalized. They're tied to global economic forces, okay? And, and one of the most important ones for looking at William Jennings Bryan uh, is going to be the, the Panic of 1893, okay? Uh, there's a whole bunch of factors involved, including uh, railroad speculation and, and a collapse of, of markets in Argentina, of all places, uh, but what it leads to is a stock market crash that within urban areas, uh, we see the first kind of period of massive unemployment. Okay, the Panic of 1893, uh, on average, unemployment in the United States is 10%, uh, and it lasts for about four years. It's the Panic of 1893 to 1897. Um, but in some areas, in some cities, uh, Philadelphia, quite notably, you have unemployment as high as 40%. Okay, so localized unemployment uh, in manufacturing areas could be incredibly uh, bad. And also, uh, because of the collapse that came with this panic, you have crop prices are hit very, very hard. Okay? Now, why does that matter for William Jennings Bryan? Well, in the context of these agricultural problems and the problems for workers, um, there's a lot of concern that no longer will the kind of like small family farm be able to exist, okay? That the, the small farmer is being increasingly put under pressure. Uh, one of the factors is gonna be railroads, and, and railroads uh, give preferential rates to their kind of, their cronies, uh, right? Which means that the small farmer found it incredibly difficult to afford to send their product to market. Um, and, and another thing that, that a lot of kind of the laborers and agricultural workers at this time looked at was the idea is that in the Midwest, in the, in the Plain States, and in the farming states, 
uh, they weren't the ones holding the power anymore, that the bankers of the East, here's J.P. Morgan, uh, and, and the uh, railroad interests of the East, that they were the ones who were calling the shots, that, that they were the ones who were profiting at the expense of kind of like the common man. Uh, so some efforts are made to help farmers uh, in particular. Uh, one of those is uh, the Farmers Alliance and the other is the Grange. Uh, and the, the, the Grange in particular had a pretty significant presence in Wisconsin. Uh, its state convention was held in this building uh, in Elko. Okay, so that's, that's just up the road in Elko. Uh, and they're actually, the, the uh, historical society there started a restoration of that Granger uh, Hall uh, actually just this last year. So uh, that might be an, an interesting thing to look for an update on. Um, so with these problems for workers and for, for farmers, uh, you actually get a new political party formed. And, and it becomes uh, what historians will consider the, the strongest third party movement in America, in American history, right? In American political history. And it's the People's Party or the Populist Party. Uh, their convention is in 1892. Uh, they are based in Nebraska. Uh, so they're a, a Western party that stands for farmers. And what they envision is a coalition of farmers and factory workers, what, what they would call the, the common man, uh, would unite together uh, for their best interests against the interests of the bankers and the railroads. Those were two particular uh, targets that came out of this. So their conventions in 1892, kind of like right before that panic of 1893. So this political party has formed. The panic of 1893 very much seems to confirm a lot of what the populist party had election of U.S. Senators. Uh, up to this point, uh, Senators had been elected by the state legislature. Uh, so they, they advocate for direct election of them. They want presidents to have a single term. Okay, so single term presidents. They wanted government control or at least regulation of railroads, telegraphs, and telephones. Okay, they saw all of those things as needing to be under government uh, kind of stewardship. They wanted an eight hour workday uh, and, and this is perhaps kind of the, the most infamous one or the most difficult one to understand, they wanted free coinage of silver at a rate of 16 to 1. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, up to this point, the United States uh, had gone back and forth between a gold standard uh, and also coining silver. Uh, however, uh, starting with the Silver Purchase Act, they had kind of eliminated silver from currency. That meant that we were tied to gold. This works really well if you want to be part of a global economy. The gold standard is universal and it's a standard of exchange that can be used. But the gold standard means you only can have, because gold's a finite thing, right? You can only have as much currency out there as there is gold in the treasury. And that really helps people that already have money. If you already have money and it's tied to gold, you're doing very well. What happens as time goes on is we actually have deflation, right? We talk about today, everyone's concerned about inflation, rising prices. Then you had falling prices, deflation. Once you think about that, you're like, well, that must be good, right? Not necessarily. Not if you're a farmer or a factory worker where the price of your product keeps going down. If you're a farmer and you've taken out a mortgage, which most have, that mortgage, as time goes on, will get increasingly harder to pay off because you're getting less and less money for your crops. There's particularly an issue for cash crop states. This wouldn't necessarily be as big of a deal in Wisconsin, but cash crops that were tied to export, like cotton, they were really struggling because of deflation. So as the prices of things drop, the lower classes found themselves increasingly strapped. Their wages would drop. The price they got for their crops would drop. In the meantime, bankers that already had a lot of money saw their money gain in value just by sitting still. So the populace want more metal put into circulation, and they call that free silver. Okay? Now, some will point out that the Wizard of Oz ties this all together, which is bizarre. 
However, if you think about populism and, and, and what's going on, you know, Frank Baum uh, writes this, it's set in Kansas, uh, and you have people interpret this that the Tin Man is the factory worker who is like soulless, he doesn't have a heart. The Scarecrow is the, is the farmer uh, who lacks a brain because he's a dumb hick or a hayseed or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and in the original novel, if you've read it, Dorothy's slippers aren't ruby, they're silver, uh, right? So there you have the coinage of silver that allows her to navigate the yellow brick road, which represents gold, to Oz, which is the abbreviation for ounce, which is how silver and gold are, are measured, right? So it's notable too, we could go deep into it, but it's notable too that the wicked witches are from the east and the west, right? That's the location of the, the railroad and the banking tycoons. Okay, so, so this party's formed in 1892. It gets a big boost in popularity with the Depression of 1893. And then you have William Jennings Bryan. Okay, so he's from Illinois, moves to Nebraska and becomes a congressman there. He's elected to two terms in Congress and he's a Democrat. He's not a member of the People's Party. However, he does pick up on a lot of their platform items being from Nebraska. So at the Democratic Convention in 1896, the 36-year-old, rather young, and in fact, he's going to be the youngest uh, presidential candidate to get an electoral vote at age 36, uh, in a convention that doesn't quite know who they want yet, William Jennings Bryan gives his famous cross of gold speech. Uh, and in that uh, speech, William Jennings Bryan uh, basically makes the argument for the common man. Okay, and so uh, this is this this part I'll call the commoner, which was also the name of William Jennings Bryan's uh, newspaper. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, in this cross of gold speech, which kind of like rallies the convention uh, with this one speech. Uh, William Jennings Bryan says, the man who is employed for wages is as much a businessman as his employer. The farmer who goes forth in the morning and toils all day, begins in the spring and toils all summer, and by the application of brain and muscle to the natural resources of this country creates wealth, is as much a businessman as the man who goes upon the board of trade and bets upon the price of grain. And he ends with an advocation of the coinage of silver, saying, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. The gold standard is slowly leading to our ruin. Uh, and with that, Brian you know, rallies the Democrats uh, who really adopt that People's Party uh, platform. Uh, and therefore, this, this really does represent a huge political shift uh, a political realignment in America. Um, and Brian then starts a campaign that's pretty notable uh, with the rather bizarre running mate of uh, Arthur Sewell, who is a shipbuilder from Maine, uh, who had held a very small political post beforehand. Uh, Brian goes on the first whistle stop campaign. Uh, it was William Jennings Bryan that invented this idea of using the railroad uh, to stop in towns, give a speech from the back of the, the railroad car, uh, and move along. And, and he certainly did it up. I mean, we're maybe familiar with Harry Truman's whistle stop campaign, uh, but Brian uh, went 18,000 miles in total on this, uh, giving up to 20 speeches a day uh, on this campaign tour. Um, in total, there were 600 speeches in all. And so I'd like to look at this in Wisconsin to give you a sense of, of these whistle stops. Uh, in, in Wisconsin, if we trace his 1896 campaign, um, on October 30th, he started speaking at 8.30 in the morning in Green Bay. Then he stopped at De Pere, Kakana, Appleton, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac. At Fond du Lac, there was a crowd of 10,000 people. And William Jennings Bryan, by the way, in these huge audiences, even a crowd of 10,000, they would say everyone could hear him as plain as day. Uh, so I'd imagine he must have had quite the booming voice to, to enable that to be done at a time before 
audio uh, enhancements. Then he went to Juneau, then to Watertown, then to Jefferson, then to Fort Atkinson, then to Janesville, then to Evansville, then to UW-Madison, then to the state capitol itself. He gave his speech at the state capitol at 7.45 p.m. Then he stopped one more time that same day in Monroe, Wisconsin. Then, before, this, before the end of, I imagine the sun has set, but before the end of October 30th, he made one more speech in Galena, Illinois. Then he took an overnight train, and the next morning he started speaking in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, which was 160 miles away. Okay, so this is a mad, mad speaking tour that he's going on with this whistle-stop campaign. Um, now, people made fun of him at the time, right, for you know, touting his 16-to-1 ideology. Uh, and if you look at the crowd in this image, um, they're not portrayed in a very flattering way. Uh, the farmers that he is appealing to. But Brian's problem wasn't necessarily that he didn't rally the people. He did that very, very well. The problem was that his opponent uh, had a much bigger war chest. Okay, Brian spent, had about $650,000 uh, in his campaign, and he tried to make up for uh, kind of a smaller budget by speaking because his opponent, William McKinley, had a $16 million budget, okay? Uh, to, in today's money, that would be half a billion dollars, uh, which, I mean, I guess compared to today's campaigns, that actually seems uh, not that big if $14 billion was spent in, in 2020, right? Um, so McKinley is going to have probably the most polar opposite campaign you can think of. He gives the front porch campaign in which he stayed at home and gave speeches from his front porch, and the media would come to him and then report on it. Uh, that was how McKinley rolled. However, he has all this money, and with all that money, they do a very good job of attacking William Jennings Bryan. Uh, here is a, is a tool of the silver interests. Uh, this is uh, something else that was distributed, uh, kind of like phony money showing William Jennings Bryan on a dollar bill that would be only worth 53 cents. So uh, with his money, William McKinley's campaign uh, was able to distribute 250 million pamphlets in America, uh, which meant that, that that averaged out to 17 different flyers or letters or you know, phony dollar bills to every eligible voter in the country at the time, OK? Uh, so one historian commented that money talked louder than Brian could uh, in this campaign. Well, how did this turn out? Uh, McKinley had a 4.5% margin in the nation uh, and more substantial in the electoral votes. Um, a 13% margin for, for McKinley in Wisconsin, uh, which was actually the biggest win for McKinley outside of, uh, of the Northeast states. However, in Marathon County, and this is what stood out to me, in Marathon County, the margin for uh, McKinley was only 1.6%, uh, which actually means that we were the tightest county in the state uh, in the election of 1896. It was only 120 votes that separated Bryan and McKinley, showing that this county was, like it is today, very much kind of a bellwether, right? Uh, this county was a very, very tightly contested race in that election. Okay, so... And intriguingly enough, earlier in 1896, Wassa had actually elected a People's Party mayor. Okay, so uh, Emory Anderson uh, was, was the People's Party uh, candidate for mayor, and he won. Uh, and now, this is in the spring election, not the same one that McKinley won. This was in the spring, and he won by a single vote. Uh, so that, that's going on at this time. Now, Wasso only had a, a one-year term for mayors at the time as well. Uh, so we're not going to say that Emory Anderson's single term as populist mayor of Wasso is going to be ground-shaking or anything like that. But it's just an interesting note. Okay, so uh, the local papers uh, did like to celebrate that McKinley did win. It's McKinley and Prosperity. Uh, and if you look here, we've got a, a tombstone for papocracy, uh, which is a, you know, hybrid word apartment two of uh, populism and, and democracy, right? Um, however, here's the big deal. Brian's kind of adoption of these populist party elements really does shape the Democratic Party for the next couple decades, okay? And so here you've got 
uh, you know, the, the populist party swallowing up the Democrats and what ends up being a significant realignment. Bryan is around again for the election of 1900. The Democrats decide to run him again, but this time the issue isn't silver, uh, in part because of the Klondike gold rush has pushed a lot of fresh gold into the American economy. Uh, the issue now is what do we do with our role in the world? So after the Spanish-American War, the mil U.S. military is in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. What do we do with these territories? And uh, we may be familiar with Teddy Roosevelt and San Juan Hill from this. Um, proponents of an American interventionist role in the world, like Teddy Roosevelt, wanted McKinley the president to basically just annex these territories, to, to make an American empire. Uh, and it's William Jennings Bryan that is the voice of people that say, no, that's not what America is about. And so the Wasa paper at this time stands up and, and says, uh, basically Bryan's line, which is, do we want to be an empire? Uh, and and in, in the case of the Wasa pilot article uh, here from 1900, it says, you know, basically, no, we, we don't want that. Uh, and, and it says that you know, we do not uh, want to support the idea of the American people ruling over others. So here's Brian again stumping for uh, the campaign in 1900. This uh, photograph was taken in Milwaukee. Um, but the popularity of imperialism is pretty significant. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt is now McKinley's running mate. Wisconsin units, including a company from Wausau, uh, so it's Company G of the uh, 3rd Wisconsin, I believe. Yeah, 3rd Volunteers for Wisconsin, Company G, uh, had seen fighting in Puerto Rico. Uh, only one of the members of the Wausau company died, and it was of disease, not of actual combat. Uh, but when they come back, just to kind of show you where Wausau is at with this, they're, they're welcomed as heroes, right? Uh, there is uh, a huge celebration for them. Uh, G.D. Jones, local lawyer and, and businessman, uh, says uh, this was not a war of conquest, but was, raged in, was waged in the interest of humanity. There has been no war more just than this, uh, which if you know a little bit about the Spanish-American War and everything else, that's not necessarily an accurate statement. Uh, but they were welcomed home. Uh, Mrs. Kickbush saying, home sweet home, there was an illuminated bicycle parade uh, for them, and they then presented uh, Louis Marchetti with a uh, cane as a gift. The company presented that to Louis Marchetti. Okay, so there isn't going to be much sympathy for anti-imperialism in Wausau in 1900, is basically what, what we're looking at here, even though William Jennings Bryan uh, will uh, pitch this as, a, as, as something that doesn't stand up for the ideals of democracy. By the way, during that celebration, they also staged a little um, show in which Uncle Sam was shown to be uh, holding uh, a woman dressed as Puerto Rico on one arm uh, and a woman dressed as, as Cuba on the other, uh, celebrating our newfound territory. In that election, it's quite notable, too, that Brian is a great speaker, but he's facing another pretty uh, impressive speaker, and that's Teddy Roosevelt, okay, as, as vice president who soon will be president. Uh, and so in this election, uh, McKinley widens his margin. Uh, in Wisconsin, he gets a 25% margin of the vote. Uh, and in Marathon County, it's 11% margin for McKinley. Uh, and so here's Brian depicted as kind of just changing up silver for anti-imperialism. Uh, right, and, and saying that, you know, Brian is just an opportunist picking on that. But I'd like to, to think that he was sincere uh, when he felt that the principles of a republic uh, don't necessarily connect with the idea of an empire. Again, McKinley wins quite handily. 1908, Brian runs again for the Democrats. Uh, and uh, as you can maybe predict, the margin widens even more. Uh, for our purposes, what I like about this is, you know, Brian is still championing the common man in 1908. Uh, but what's, what's kind of fun is that uh, in 1908, um, as we have the kind of the also run twice candidate, 
um, you get the first use of mass media in a campaign. And so I came across this ad for James Music Company on Scott Street, uh, and it was for um, buying an a audio recording of William Jennings Bryan. And uh, these were available. Uh, the Edison Phonograph Company had recorded William Jennings Bryan on the early cylindrical phonographs, uh, and they sold uh, thousands of William Jennings Bryan's speeches uh, for 35 cents a phonograph. You could buy that, and you could get those right here uh, in Wausau as well. Um, so th and that's really the first time you would have any sort of mass communication used in politics is 1908. Uh, in one, uh, not here, but in uh, a penny arcade in New York, they actually set up uh, a kind of like mannequin of William Jennings Bryan and a mannequin uh, of uh, a Taft, because he's running against Taft in 1908, and then they played the phonographs of them so you could see like a live debate, so to speak, uh, there. Okay, but Taft wins. Carrying on in many ways, uh, you know, Taft is, is Teddy Roosevelt's uh, successor, and Taft wins by an even greater margin here in 1908 uh, and, and uh, keeps that. Now, so what's William Jennings Bryan doing? Uh, he, he's still around. Uh, this is his home uh, in Nebraska, his, his mansion. And uh, he's actually making quite a bit of money at this point uh, as a speaker. Okay? He publishes his own newspaper called The Commoner. Uh, and he takes part in the, uh, during this time, he's taking part in the Chautauqua cir uh, circuit of, of lectures and, and speeches. Uh, and he's getting uh, $250 a speech for that. Okay, so during a typical summer, uh, given his ability to just speak, you know, again and again, William Jennings Bryan was used to making $2,000 a week uh, on the speaking circuit. So he was, he was a millionaire uh, and, and was still very, very involved in uh, politics. Okay, so then in 1912, as you might know, this is when Woodrow Wilson gets elected, uh, and Bryan is made Secretary of State. Uh, so I, I feel like, you know, Brian is maybe always the bridesmaid, but never the bride, or however you want to look at him. He does become Secretary of State in the Wilson administration, right? As a prominent Democrat, uh, he's, he's chosen for that role. However, even though he's in that Wilson administration, Brian is still speaking for the Chautauqua circuit, okay? Uh, used to the money he's making, he insists that he cannot... Uh, make ends meet with just his Secretary of State salary. Um, and he actually says, I need the money uh, from the speaking circuit, uh, which a lot of observers really got upset about that. Uh, his salary as Secretary of State was $12,000 a year, um, a lot less than what he's used to, but if you put that in today's money, William Jennings Bryan was making $350,000 as Secretary of State. Okay, and he still wanted to go on the speaking circuit. That's when he first comes to Wausau. So everything we've kind of like set up to this point just shows you that, I mean, he's a three-time presidential candidate. He's kind of the, the elder statesman of the Democratic Party. He's this renowned speaker where you can buy his recordings, and then he shows up in Wausau in 1913. Okay, so um, shows up at the depot, and he gives a, a speech that's part of his kind of like Chautauqua circuit speeches. It's not a political speech. He gets one of his Chautauqua speeches here that he's done again and again and again. And this is where um, his involvement here involves Louis Marchetti. And, and uh, Gary, I watched your uh, film on Louis Marchetti. Uh, and uh, as Gary points out, and this is available on, on the, the Historical Society uh, site, uh, Louis Marchetti, a very well-connected Democrat, uh, is involved with getting William Jennings Bryan here. Uh, and in Louis Marchetti's history, he talks about that this is when Bryan speaks. He doesn't say at the YMCA, but he says through the auspices of the, the YMCA. So I, I'd, I'd imagine it was much more likely at this time he spoke uh, at, a, at a larger hall. Um, but this is his kind of ongoing uh, speeches through the Chautauqua series. When William Jennings Bryan comes here, uh, he gives a speech that he's given before in, in this format, and it is a speech about the importance of Christianity. 
Uh, William J. Bryan is a fundamentalist Christian, uh, and he gives a speech called The Prince of Peace, uh, which was one of his most famous speeches. It was uh, turned into a book, uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, here in 1913. All right. Then, uh, about a year later, okay, so uh, he shows up again in Wausau, this time for political purposes. Remember, he's you know, doing these Chautauqua speeches, like the Prince of Peace, but he also is Secretary of State. So he comes here more in his, um, his role as Secretary of State in 1914. Uh, this is November. Uh, and uh, he, I'm sorry, that was, uh, November was his 1913 visit. Um, 1914 is October 28th. So right before the 1914 midterm elections is when he's showing up. Uh, he shows up, uh, his train is late, uh, so he only has about 25 minutes to speak. Uh, as part of this speech, which takes place at, at the old opera hall, um, he uh, is, is really stumping for the Democrats because it's, it's election time. And so he is there um, with the Democratic candidate for governor of Wisconsin, a, a guy by the name of Judge, Judge Carroll, who does not win. Um, and uh, he talks about the importance of, you know, voting Democratic to give Wilson uh, the ability to push through his program. Intriguingly here, you can see the Daily Herald's take on it. Uh, Daily Herald being fairly Republican in sympathy, not very impressed with William Jennings Bryan, and attacks him for you know omitting all of these things that the administration has screwed up. Uh, and so if, if you look at what the Daily Herald says in its commentary, it says, he did not tell the people that the country was prosperous. I did not tell them that the cost of living had gone down. He did not even say that they had fulfilled the pledges on which they were elected. So the, the Daily Herald in Wausau really likes to shred uh, the Democrats here and, and William Jennings Bryan. However, it was a big deal uh, for the city at the time. Uh, kids were let out a half day of school. Uh, ladies clubs uh, had, had, had gathered and, and gone to it. Uh, and and the, the crowd could not be held in, in the opera house. This is a very big deal. And quite intriguingly, too, this guy is with William Jennings Bryan uh, when he comes to Wausau. He, remember William Jennings Bryan is stumping for the Democrats. He's running for U.S. Senator on the Democratic ticket. His name is Paul Hustings. He's from uh, near Fond du Lac. Uh, and he will win. Uh, he will become the U.S. Senator from Wisconsin uh, elected in that 1914 election. That makes the U.S. Senate a tie. Okay, so you have, you have a tied Senate, uh, Democrat and Republican, uh, in 1914. However, Hustings then is going to be duck hunting with his brother and will be accidentally shot in the back by his brother in kind of a Dick Cheney 2006 moment. Uh, and, uh, and unlike Dick Cheney in 2006, though, uh, uh, the, he actually dies. Uh, so that's significant because with the Senate totally tied, Hustings' death leads to a special election, and a Republican is elected. The Democrats lose their control of the Senate, okay, which means that Wilson is going to struggle to push through any of his programs after that. Uh, so that's actually a pretty significant moment, uh, and a guy who was here with William Jennings Bryan in 1914. Okay, now, William Jennings Bryan is Secretary of State. Um, really bringing a weird sense, uh, at least from foreign affairs, of we should do what's right uh, in, in the world. And as you might know, as we get into the events leading to World War I, uh, German U-boats are sinking ships, most famously the Lusitania, a British liner with 120-some Americans aboard. And William Jennings Bryan uh, tells Wilson, if you're going to object to the Lusitania, then you also have to object to how the British are violating some of the rules of warfare. Uh, Wilson refuses, and because of that, uh, the, the lack of, of Wilson's uh, perceived uh, neutrality, uh, Brian uh, does what he feels is right, and he resigns as Secretary of State. Uh, he says, you know, you're going to lead us into war. And Brian had actually even suggested that uh, Americans stop trading with any country at war, which um, would not be good for the economy, but Brian said we need to stay out of war. Again, as a man of principles, uh, that's what he argued for, and he did quit uh, as Secretary of State.
Brian's still going to be a significant force, though, okay? Uh, and no longer in an official uh, political position, uh, William Jennings Bryan, as we enter the 1920s, is going to be very active in that speaking circuit, uh, circuit uh, standing up for traditional religious ideas. And in ways now you start to see William Jennings Bryan is kind of a, a guy who's fighting against modernity, right? He stood up for the small family farm as it was increasingly disappearing. Now he's standing up for traditional morality and an old fashioned America, as now America starts to look like this as we get into the 1920s. Uh, and you know, William Jennings Bryan, like many Americans, will take part in these new things, electricity and automobiles. But at the same time, Americans are rather skeptical of some of the more socially minded changes that are taking place at this time. And particularly for the purposes of William Jennings Bryan, it's what he sees uh, as, a, as a turn away from traditional religious values, that with modernity is coming uh, a, a kind of uh, an atheistic nation. And so this is where William Jennings Bryan uh, is going to get involved in uh, debates about Christianity. So just kind of give you reference here, uh, this is Wausau, and uh, this is from 1924, uh, and Wausau too is, is transformed during this time. It's, it's very different from when William Jennings Bryan was first running for office in 1896. Uh, and this is when William Jennings Bryan gets involved in the Scopes trial. So Dayton, Tennessee, uh, a teacher is uh, accused of teaching evolution, which was specifically banned in Tennessee. Uh, his name is John Scopes. Uh, and in what becomes known as you know, the trial of the century, William Jennings Bryan goes to Dayton and argues for uh, the prosecution, uh, saying that Scopes uh, should be punished for teaching evolution. And Bryan had for a long, long time uh, argued against evolution, argued for a literal interpretation of the Bible. Uh, he had uh, preached and, and, and talked about the, the existence of miracles. Uh, and he does the same in Dayton. Uh, and maybe quite famously, he takes the stand himself uh, and argues that everything in the Bible should be interpreted as such and doesn't do too well under cross-examination. But uh, in any case, he actually wins this one. Right? And this is what's kind of ironic, perhaps, is that it's, it's not until very late that, that Brian has a clear-cut victory, uh, and he, his side does win the Scopes trial, uh, and the forces of, of kind of traditional Christianity there, there do win, uh, and Scopes is fined $100. Uh, so in the grand scheme of things, what happened to Scopes isn't so significant. It's just that this debate existed at the time. And as you may know, then Brian died a couple days later. Uh, so uh, probably with the stress of the Scopes trial, having a little something to do with it. Although you got to say too, uh, within two days of the Scopes trial being over, Brian once again went on the speaking circuit uh, and probably should have taken a little time off. So Brian's visits to Wausau fit into a broader context of this guy, right? And I think it's interesting to say like, you know, how do we interpret William Jennings Bryan? Uh, on one hand, you see him as leading, like being very significant in that, that realignment of the Democratic Party, taking those populist platform ideas, silver, standing up for the farmer and the laborer, and, and those uh, platform items get integrated into the Democratic Party and indeed get adopted by some Republicans too. Many of the things that Brian had been arguing for, like railroad regulation and direct election of senators, those become law uh, by the time you get to 1920. And so in ways, he's kind of like the, the maybe the trailblazer of uh, progressive politics at this time. He sets a new, st a new tone uh, and a new direction uh, for politics in America. And so he's, he's in that regard, maybe we could relate him to someone like AOC, right? This young, remember Brian, when he's first elected, is 36 years old. Uh, and, and that, when he's running for president, uh, or maybe like a Bernie Sanders, right? This progressive champion, and, and Bernie Sanders too, you know, has national aspirations, never quite making it, always around uh, type guy. However, oh, by the way, if you want a good book, this is probably the, one of the better ones that came across when doing some background on this. Uh, he calls William Jennings Bryan a godly hero. 
Uh, you know, again, always fighting for what's morally right. Um, in his kind of standing up for Christianity, and as a Secretary of State who argues for a moral role in America, uh, that America should have morality when it comes to how they interact with the world, maybe we can see William Jennings Bryan as, as kind of like a Jimmy Carter, right? A person who's devout in their faith and a person who says that America should have, it, Jimmy Carter's line was a human rights foreign policy, right? That we should do what's right in our relationship with other nations. Okay, so maybe he's, maybe he's more like Jimmy Carter than a Bernie Sanders or AOC. However, uh, Brian's political opponents at the time depicted him as a bit of a quack, as a snake oil salesman, as a demagogue, a person that had these incredibly simple responses to the problems of the time, right? Oh, uh, farmers and laborers aren't doing well, we can solve it all with silver. Uh, the issue of the day is America not being a empire. The issue of the day is the tariff. The issue of the day is fundamental Christianity. And if we just go back to Christianity, it will solve all the problems of modernity. And in that regard, William Jennings Bryan is a demagogue, someone who's maybe more interested with going on the Chautauqua circuit than they are with acting as Secretary of State. Some commentators in recent day have made parallels to another politician, and that's Donald Trump. The Wall Street Journal in 2016, in July of 2016, ran an article entitled, The Trump Before Trump, and it was about William Jennings Bryan. So it's intriguing to me, and, and, and I tend to think that if we look at William Jennings Bryan's career, uh, that he was someone who was sincere. Uh, and so I tend to still side with the idea that he was a, a, a man of principles who stood up for what he thought was right. However, it's important to note that people at the time perhaps viewed him very differently. In any case, Wausau becomes part of this grand national scene during these times. And William Jennings Bryan's visits here uh, really demonstrate uh, a, a much kind of broader picture of what's going on in American politics uh, in the 1890s through the 1920s. Uh, so hopefully there's been some helpful background here and uh, those couple short visits uh, to Wausau that William Jennings Bryan has uh, fit into the part of a bigger story, not just about Wausau and Marathon County, but about uh, politics in America. Thanks guys.